What was it like to live in an ancient Greek city? Did every city have an Acropolis or just Athens? How did people find their way around town? Were there street signs or did they have good GPS? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about, first, the typical layout, streets, precincts, walls, and neighborhood of a Greek town or city. Second, how these layouts came to be, that is, why the streets precincts, temples, etc., were located where they were in a typical Greek town or city. Third, the buildings, both sacred and public, typically found in a Greek town or city. And finally, the buildings and precincts, typically found outside the walls in a Greek town or city. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe. And that little bell thingy. So I continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. Greek cities took two forms. One, the unplanned city which often coalesced when several nearby villages, or we might even call them hamlets, grew organically in population and size, coming to form a single town, such as Athens or Sparta. We see that here, especially in Sparta. These, Mesoa, Pitana, Kisura, and Limnae, were in fact the four separate villages that came together to form what we today call Sparta. Similar things happened in Athens on this side, also on Thebes up here. Now, these streets would have followed the original tracks that linked these villages and hamlets, the wells and the water sources together, following the lay of the land. Secondly, there is the planned city, usually a colony, though sometimes also a city, an unplanned city, originally an unplanned city, that had been destroyed through war of natural disaster, which is then going to be rebuilt. Anyway, the planned city built on a grid, with straight streets crossing at right angles, overcoming any and all obstacles. And if the gradient was too steep, steps were simply used. We see this here, of course, classically in Alexandria. Notion, actually it's pronounced Notion, but interesting, they had a city of Notion. I have a notion to go to Notion. Uh, this, of course, is the city of Miletos here and there. Okay, this is Notion. And of course, the city of Miletos. Whether planned or organic, Greek cities normally had long, slim blocks separated by narrow feeder streets, which led into a few wider main streets at right angles. As the Greeks seem to have thought of cities as a series of rectangular blocks designed from the inside out, abutting either a shore or a steep hillside, and walled in such a way to enhance defense, no matter the topography. You see here, of course, the plan of Thury in Calabria. Creane, you can see the long, slim blocks, of course. Uh, this is Helicarnassos and Senenunte, Sicily.
There was, however, no common model, as every Greek city had a great variety and diversity. In the ways that public and private space interacted, including temple precincts and the agora or marketplace, mostly due to the local topography, coastlines, hills, ravines, water sources, gullies, what have you, which also influenced the sites of town walls and gates, the necropolis and a harbor, if any. But expense also played a role. If, for example, the streets were going to be replatted on a grid, because often it was too expensive to reorient or tear down and rebuild a major temple or public building or the walls, when the money could be better spent on other projects, such as building or maintaining harbors, bridges, terracing hillsides, new temples, old temples, whatever. Now, despite the oft-repeated line from Aristotle, and you see this, man, you can just see this all over the internet. The oft-repeated line from Aristotle, that one, Hippodamos of Miletos, during the 5th century BC, was the first to plan cities on a grid pattern that he was the first in the world, in fact, to do so, which is shown to be demonstrably false for the rest of the world, but also false in the Greek world. As excavations over the last hundred years or so show that by the 7th century BC, Greek towns and cities were being laid out as grids of rectangular blocks divided by wide, larger streets in smaller neighborhood streets. You see that in these plans here. Normally speaking, colonies at first formed an irregularly planned settlement. Streets and houses and temples and public buildings spread out according to desire and topography. But usually, in the second and third generations, things changed. People seem to, the denizens seem to want to beautify their town. First generation is simply worried about survival. Second, third generation, let's make it better. So the settlement would be reorganized on a grid pattern, usually with several long streets or platii as major thoroughfares, which would end at the city gates, a temple or a major topographical obstacle. And these usually follow the first paths laid out in the settlement with smaller roads or stenopoi running at 90 degree angles across them, thus dividing the settlement into long strips or plots. What you can see here, this is a uh, Neapolis, or what will come to be known as Naples. This is Heraclea in Laconia. The original plan of Miletos, 800 BC, which is all over the place. And if you look at the earlier plan, back to this thing. Where's my earlier plan? The later plan, I should say, nicely all laid out, quite a different thing. Of course, the archaic Miletos, you can certainly kind of see it here. So the or the, this part in between here, uh, that was the original archaic city plant and the later rectangular plant laid over it. Now, these long blocks or strigae were usually occupied by a pair of back-to-back -back houses with a small alley or ambitus running between them. You can see this here. This is the strigae of the town of Heliais, 
and the Argolid, uh, but especially from the excavations here at Olynthos. So each of these is a house, and there's this little thing in between is the ambitus, the alleyway. This, of course, is trying to be what a uh, house would have looked like better. Anyway, the ambitus running between them, while temple precincts and public buildings were integrated into the grid as best they could, as many existed, as mentioned previously, from the first year of settlement. And thus, for financial or religious reasons, were too difficult to reorient, again, as mentioned earlier, often winding up with some odd street angles. Now, whether in the original settlement or a later colony, houses were normally built haphazardly across the area though they tended to be clustered around wells and natural paths on the land, which then went into determining the location of the streets, while the house sizes, normally at first, people just trying to worry about survival, normally at first single-roomed of about 30 by 50 feet on a square or oblong plot with plenty of space around them, meant that as the settlement grew, empty land was filled in with new housing developments or owners expanding or selling off excess land for others to build houses. The Agora, however, the marketplace, wasn't always placed at the center of the settlement, nor was it normally regularly shaped as agari were usually built with major streets running into them or alongside of them to make it easier to bring in and ship out goods to the harbor, the industrial zone, nearby towns and cities, or just the different parts of the city itself. The Athenian agora, for example, shown here, was a large a regularly shaped area of 30 acres. Notice it's not nicely square, it's not rectangular, it is kind of weirdly oblong. As elsewhere, it was located between the main gates and the Acropolis and was the administrative heart of Athens. The law courts, the bulletarian in Tholos, the public record hall, the Metroon, army and navy headquarters, the mint, the keepers of weights and measurements, shrines, temples, the stoa, commercial buildings, and the hippodrome and stadion around the edges or nearby. No matter the town or city, the agora was where people, mostly but not exclusively men, shopped, socialized, discussed issues, litigated, exchanged coin, bought goods and slaves, and occasionally voted, which depends on the local government. As the poet Eubulos said, quote, you will find everything sold together in the same place in the agora. Figs, witnesses to summons, bunches of grapes, turnips, pears, apples, givers of evidence, roses, meddlers, porridge, honeycombs, chickpeas, Lawsuits, bee sting puddings, myrtle, allotment machines, irises, lambs, water clocks, laws, students and teachers, and indictments. It was not until the Hellenistic period that new Greek sediments, you see here those at Priain, Baalbek, the, the rebuilt Ephesus, and of course the rebuilt Miletos, began to locate their agora in the city center, with temples, shrines, public buildings, and permanent shops around it, a few wide main streets connecting the gates and harbor, harbor if any. Nearby, as mentioned, would have been the buildings where city governance took place, assuming there was no ecclesia or citizens assembly 
For example, the polis was not independent. So the buildings where city governance took place, as I said, the Bulletarion, or council house for the city's Gerizia, or as in Athens, the Bulle, and where public records were kept, the Metroon. Most cities, Athens certainly, had a tholos nearby, which essentially acted as a kind of public hotel for visiting dignitaries, assuming they couldn't get a room in some other illustrious Athenian's house. But also, at least in Athens, to house the on-call Prytanes in their shifts, and for that, view the uh, other video for that. There would also normally be, built up against a hillside to avoid the expense of constructing a large structure on which to put the seats, an open-air theater, or theatron, where plays, but also public meetings, could take place on sunny or at least non-stormy days. The expense of lighting a stage at night, by the way, normally precluded night performances or meetings. However, in some towns and cities, the ecclesia, or the political assembly for the polis, again, where the polis was independent, would meet somewhere other than the theatron. In Athens, this was on the Nix. Yes, spell with a P, kind of like pneumonia. And we see it here. This is the Nix. You can see it here. This is the Agora. That's the Stoa. And off in the distance is the Nix. This was originally a rocky outcrop about a half mile from the Acropolis, where steps were at first cut into the rock for seats to face a speaker's platform and a flat area of the outcrop. Though eventually a terrace platform, which is what you see here, was built into the hillside and seating built on it to hold the entire citizenry. Remember, that's only the males of a certain age, higher citizenry of the city. Also inside the typical city would have been a racetrack or hippodrome for both horse and chariot racing. Though primarily these aren't built in stone until the Hellenistic period. There would also be a stadion, yes, we would say stadium, they said stadion, but foot races and other athletic exhibitions. Though the most elaborate ones were before the Hellenistic period, at the sites of the major Pan-Hellenic Games, that is, Olympia, that's the one you see right here, Nemea, for the Nemean Games, uh, Nemea right near, near Argos, and of course, Sikion, which is not depicted here, Delphi, that's the stadium of Delphi, Athens, depicted here, and Delos. Industrial zones, especially the pottery shops or keramikoi, from once we get the word ceramics, since they use kennels with fire and a good deal of smoke, were whenever possible sighted away from where people lived even outside the walls in some places, either near a harbor where the pottery could be loaded onto ships without too much worry of it breaking when a wagon or cart hit a rut or bump in the road, which might be disastrous when you think about it, though some shops could be found near major temple complexes to ease the sale of ceramic votives or worshipers. So at the Kramakoi, so with other craft shops. Those that made a lot of noise, used fire, or produced bad smells, such as metal workers, forges, tanneries, launderers, barrel makers, slaughterhouses, etc., were also confined to non-residential areas. 
often near a harbor or a water source because some required water in production, or were out in the suburbs beyond the city walls. Temples, shrines, and other sacred precincts were usually located by the local topography, either on high spots where they would be visible by travelers by land or sea, for example, the Parthenon on the Athenian Acropolis, on the city's boundaries for various religious reasons, or any place within the city that inspired awe. In other words, if you go to a place and you get sort of shivers down the spine for no reason, it might be the dwelling of a god or some spirit. Well, the Chthonic deities had shrines based on some feature in the landscape. If, however, a settlement was far inland, far from the coast, for example, the ones you see here, Baalbek or Palmyra, especially, which is out in the Syrian desert, far from the coast or on a plain with no high places, major temples were normally located in the city center, near or on the edge of the Agra, were also the tomb of the city's founder, worshipped as a hero, could also be found. The necropolis or cemetery, the ones you see here primarily in Athens, also Camarina, these are two in Athens, these are the Camarina in Sicily. The necropolis was never located inside the city walls, but always outside, usually in some area never intended for a future expansion as graves were not normally moved. Also, normally located outside the city walls would be a palaestra to train its soldiers in combat, or also a wrestling school, which you can think of as also a component of hand-to-hand -hand combat, would also be normally located. In the classical period, the gymnasium, literally the naked place, where men could work out in the nude, women weren't allowed in, and take a soak in the baths, as depicted here, was usually located in the suburbs beyond the city walls. But in the Hellenistic period, the new planned cities placed it inside the city itself as a way to stress Greek culture in a multi-ethnic, multicultural environment. There were, of course, many other important or magnificent buildings, monuments, and structures found in the Greek cities, especially Athens. But that is for another talk, or two, or three, or maybe more. The wrap-up quote. The city itself is a rock, situated in a plain and surrounded by dwellings. On the rock, the Acropolis is the sacred precinct of Athena, comprising both the old temple of Athena Polius, in which is the lamp that is never quenched, and the Parthenon built by Ictinos, in which is the work in ivory by Phidias, the Athena Parthenos. Strabo, 20 AD. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos and that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past. <laughs>